Going to talk about uh, All Souls Day. We know that's November 2nd, another uh, uh, major celebration on the church's liturgical calendar. Uh, it's the day where we traditionally uh, pray for the faithful departed, for the deceased. And I'm going to use it as an opportunity to um, <clears throat> help remind you, and, and if you've not really had the teaching before, give you a, uh, a, a short synthesized teaching on uh, that branch of theology we called eschatology, which refers to um, the last things. Uh, traditionally, uh, the church has taught on the last things, which are judgment, uh, purgatory, heaven, and hell. Um, I did a, a, a little more complete series. If you're uh, interested in learning a little bit more uh, about this, we, we did do a series uh, called Heaven and Hell, uh, which gives you a little more in-depth teaching on what I'll talk about here in just a few minutes. But uh, it, it's something that, um, <laughs> that every one of us has to be uh, concerned about, and we should be somewhat educated. It's fundamental, essential teaching uh, of the church. And um, so on this month of November where we, we do pray for our deceased relatives, friends, for all the faithful departed, um, we'll talk about that. Uh, what are these last things? Well, we know we're, we're born, we live, and we die. As soon as we die, right at the, after the moment of death, we have what's called a particular judgment. We stand before Christ, and in the light of Christ, the truth, uh, we give an account of our, of our whole life, that particular judgment. Uh, you don't have to wait to find out what your ultimate uh, destination is going to be. Now, ultimately, as the scriptures tell us, only two ways are set before us. Two ways are set before you, O oh man, uh, the way of life and the way of death. Uh, so of all the many, many paths a human being can take in the course of human existence, ultimately there are only two destinations, heaven, hell. You win, you lose. Now, purgatory is a stop on the way to heaven. Everyone who passes through purgatory, which is basically the final purification. And by the way, a doctrine of our faith. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I respect everybody's religion. I truly do. Uh, but I don't teach Buddhism, and I don't teach Hinduism, and I don't teach Islam, and I don't teach any of the other uh, Christian uh, confessions. I teach Catholic theology. And the, part of the doctrine of the faith is the existence, the reality of purgatory. I'll read to you from, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church in, in a while on that. Uh, so the reality uh, of, a, of a particular judgment, that's a judgment you and I get in particular right at the end of our life. So the moment you die, boom, you're before Jesus, the just judge. Um, you, you've had your whole life to live a godly and upright life. Oh, you made mistakes, I made plenty of them. You fall on your face, you get up, uh, you repent, uh, you try to do the best you can. And at the end of your life, when you die, hopefully, you're gonna be in a state of grace. A state of grace, that means you are in a, you, ha you have no serious sins on your soul at that moment. Uh, that means you've, if you're Catholic, you, you've uh, repented of your sins, gone to confession, uh, hopefully, if you've had the opportunity, at least um, you've repented, uh, changed your heart, uh, and so you're in a state of grace. Let's say you, you are in a state of grace when you die. At that moment, the particular judgment, you're in a state of grace, but you have not atoned uh, for all of the sins which you've committed in your life. Um, remember in the scriptures, Jesus said, every penny will be paid. And so let's say you go before uh, the judgment seat of God, and you have this particular judgment. You're not perfect. In other words, you haven't atoned for all the sins of your life. 
Uh, you haven't gotten a plenary indulgence, uh, which we'll speak of at another time. And so you have need of purification. Listen, you have to be perfect to stand in the immediate presence of God. You can't be imperfect, flawed by sin, and think you're going to stand in the immediate presence of God in heaven. Ain't going to happen. Lucky for us, there's purgatory. Lucky for us, there's purgatory. That's the final purification. It is not a negative thing. Uh, I've had all kinds of people, including some Catholics, uh, who've said to me, oh, I don't believe in purgatory. Well, don't boast what separates you from the church. Don't boast about that. It's a doctrine of the faith. You must believe in the existence of purgatory. As one old gal once said to me, well, they believe it when they get there. Well, that's for sure. Purgatory is real. Let me read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church a little bit on purgatory. You know, this comes up often enough that it's worth taking a moment here to read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Church's official teaching on purgatory. I start with uh, paragraph 1030 of the Catechism. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Look, folks, that's not bad news. That's good news. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different, entirely different from the punishment of the damned or hell. Uh, the church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of Scripture, speaks of this cleansing fire. Now, it always comes up, people say, where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't have to say it in the Bible, because in the Catholic Church, we, we have two main fonts of revelation, sacred Scripture and sacred tradition, and they're given equal weight. And then you have the magisterium, of the church, which, which teaches definitively using those two fonts of revelation. But there are scriptural bases for this teaching. Uh, paragraph 1032 of the Catechism goes on, this teaching is based on the practice of prayer for the dead, already mentioned in sacred scripture. Quote, therefore Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin, that's in 2 Maccabees 1246. That's one of the scriptural uh, references for the uh, church's teaching on purgatory. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead, as we do on All Souls Day, and offered prayers and suffrage for them, above all the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that thus purified they may attain the beatific vision of God. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. We can pray for the deceased. We do pray for the deceased. Huh. I remember once the, uh, uh, the mentor um, of the Quarry of Ars, St. John Vianney, once, once said uh, to uh, St. John, uh, Hide my instruments of penance, his hair, shirt, his discipline. Hide this because if people find it, they'll think I'm some kind of a saint, and they'll leave me in purgatory till the end of the world. He was worried about that. He wanted people to pray for him. Um, I'm the same. Look, if I check out, please do me a huge favor. Pray for me. Uh, ask that mass be said for my soul. Say the rosary for me. I'm not taking any chances, you know. We do the best we can. We try to live a good life in a state of grace in, in accordance with God's will. I'm not perfect. Maybe you are <clears throat> or think you are. But I know I'm not, and I'll bet you think, well, I'm not so perfect either. All right. We're very fortunate that if we don't make atonement, for all the sins we commit throughout the course of our life, God has blessed us with this reality, and it is a reality, 
of purgatory. And so pray for your deceased relatives. Do it all the time. Have masses uh, said for them, especially All Souls Day. We, we do this, but you can do it uh, all along for your friends or in general for people who, who the, the, that have passed from this life into the next. Uh, pray for them. Offer your, your sacrifices, your rosaries, your masses, uh, for the deliverance of the souls in purgatory. Look, th this used to be a, a commonly taught thing. Um, it's not so commonly taught anymore, but it ought to be. The teaching of the church hasn't changed. Purgatory is still there. It's part of the doctrine of the faith. And so that's, that's one of the last things, you know. We said the particular judgment. What happens, particular judgment? Um, purgatory? heaven, hell. Now, if you're in a perfect state of grace and all purification has been made, in other words, you've atoned for all your sins. By the way, that can be done through prayers, through penances, uh, by, by, by indulgences, which is a gift the church gives to you. You should do certain works in accordance with the church's discipline, and you can receive a partial indulgence or a full indulgence. What does that mean, indulgence? Uh, that, that means remission of the temporal punishment due to sin. S say the rosary before the blessed sacrament. Go to confession, receive communion within, usually they say, eight days of, of the work, um, and then have no attachment to sin. Offer some prayers for the Holy Father's intention. You can receive that indulgence. Um, and then after that particular judgment, okay. It's purgatory, it's heaven, or hell. Those, one of those three things, purgatory, heaven, hell. Everybody who passes through purgatory goes to heaven. You make it to purgatory, partner, you're home free. You've made it. You're going to heaven. You're, you're, you're on your way to glory. Um, what about hell? That's the thing I least like to talk about. Um, it, it certainly is a negative thing, and we like to accentuate the positive, but we can't leave out the negative. You know what happens if you leave out the negative and you only have the positive? I use the analogy of an electrical current. What happens if all you have is the positive pole of an electrical current? What happens is nothing, nothing, no power. The lights go out, darkness falls. Indeed, if your light is darkness, how deep will the darkness be? And so the reality of these things, we don't like to talk about hell, but it's real. Well, who goes to hell? Those who want to. Okay? Does God ship people to hell? No. People decide to go there. God doesn't put anyone in hell. God loves the sinner. Scripture tells us God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, what's the problem then? <laughs> We're the problem. We're the problem. Some people decide they don't want to love. They don't want to love God. They don't want to e e uh, love each other. They don't want to live in grace. So they reject God. They reject each other. They reject grace. And they live in sin. Uh, you need to know what sin is. You need to know the difference between mortal sin and venial sin. These are the subjects of other teaching, but certainly uh, you study the catechism. You can look at some of our other uh, programs. <coughs> know the difference between venial sin and mortal sin. All right, hell is a reality. Those who go to hell are those who do not live in a state of sanctifying grace, and die that way. Let's say you've, uh, <clears throat> you've lived in sin all your life, but before you die, you're fortunate enough to have time, and you repent of your sins. You ask God for his mercy. Uh, at that, do you go to hell? No. No. The repentant do not go to hell. Uh, those who go to hell are only those who want to, who are obstinate to the end. Uh, one of the questions I've often gotten is a question on a passage from Scripture that talks about the unforgivable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit. 
and people uh, are always uh, feel, oh, I think I've committed that sin. I did this, I did that, and they think that they're guilty of the unforgivable sin. And, and they never are, because the people who write are alive, they're not dead. And so, the, let me tell you, the only unforgivable sin is final impenitence. <clears throat> Every other sin, you can forgive. God will forgive. Uh, people have said to me, oh, I had an abortion, Father. Is that the unforgivable sin? No! Repent of it. Ask for God's mercy. If you're Catholic, you go to confession. The priest gives you absolution. Um, um, you're forgiven. The only unforgivable sin is final impenitence. That means you go right to your death, obstinately refusing to repent. That's all. So what's the remedy? Repentance. God's mercy is far bigger than all the sin in the universe. From beginning to end, from the original sin to the last sin that will ever be committed. If you took it all, uh, condensed it, distilled it, and synthesized it, it would be less than a drop in the ocean of God's mercy. And I'm not minimalizing sin. It's horrible. It's horrible. We need to be, to, to, to be serious about sin. But I'm just trying to emphasize to you, God's mercy is bigger than your sins or mine, or all the sin in the universe. And so, please know that. And so when, when we recall these last things uh, in the month of November, because we, we have All Souls Day on November 2nd, and we're, we're reminded and encouraged by the church and the liturgical calendar to pray for the deceased, to pray for the faithful departed, recall these things, the particular judgment, that's the, the judgment the moment you die, the instant you die, you go before Christ and you're, you've got to give account of everything you've done and failed to do. Particular judgment. And then what? Well, then there's purgatory, which is a great blessing, because that's the, that's a, that allows us to be purified of any of that temporal punishment that attaches to us due to sin. And then there's the ultimate destination, the ultimate state of being for all eternity, forever. Remember, a hundred billion years is less than the first second of eternity. Remember that. Then there's heaven or hell forever. Heaven, the beatific vision. Uh, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man. What God has in store for those who love him. Heaven, oh, it's, it's something unimaginable, so beautiful, so fantastic. And hell, a horror you can't imagine either. And it's our choice. God doesn't ship us to one place or the other. We decide freely and intelligently. We have an intellect, we have a free will, and we use them, and we decide where we want to be forever. Forever. Heaven or hell. That's the frightening reality uh, of free will. God has endowed us with free will. We decide to love or not to love, to obey or not to obey, to embrace the light or the darkness, good or evil. But I know that you'll go the right way. I know you want to do the right thing. Oh, we're not perfect. We fight it out. We run the race to the finish line. But then if you do that, seriously, I, I promise you, as I've said so many times, at the end, you'll be happy you walk the straight and narrow path because you'll hear these beautiful words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. That's heaven. God bless you. God love you. And goodbye.